Live right now, send her an email in studio101 at gmail.com. And now, right to your host of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, Susan Poisner. Anyone who has ever grown a fruit tree knows that sometimes fruit tree pests get to the fruit before we do. And it is so disappointing to pick an apple fresh from your tree only to discover that a maggot got there first. Insect pests can destroy growing fruit, and they can do damage to the tree, too. And if your tree is weak because it's being ravaged by pests, it won't have much energy to grow a sweet harvest for you. So in today's episode of the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast, we are going to talk about fruit tree traps. There are so many ways that we can help control pest and disease problems, and I cover lots of those in my new online course, Integrated Pest Management for Fruit Trees. You can find out more about that on orchardpeople.com slash workshops. But today on the show, we are going to talk about fruit tree traps that you can make or you can buy to protect your trees from pest invasions. My guest is entomologist and integrated pest management expert, Christy Grigg McGuffin from the Ontario Ministry of Food and Rural Affairs. And Christy is in the studio with me today. Welcome, Christy. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming to the studio. Now, before we dive into today's topic, this is going to be a really visual show, guys. Oops, and you can even see Mike here right now. Hi, Mike. It's going to be a very visual show, so you can still listen live on realityradio101.com, but you can also tune into Orchard People's Facebook page, and you can watch us on Facebook Live. Then you'll also be able to see the insects and the traps that we are talking about. So if you're listening to the archived podcast later on, you'll be able to watch the video on Orchard People's YouTube channel. If you, describe, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll be notified once the video is up. Now, finally, today, we have a contest. We always like to have a contest during the shows. If you guys write us during the live show, you can win a copy of this book. Hopefully you can see it. It's called Mini Meadows. Grow a little patch of colorful flowers anywhere around your yard. It's by Mike Lizotte valued at $16.95. So to enter the contest, just send us an email at instudio101 at gmail.com with a question or a comment or just to say hi. So be sure to include your first name and where you're writing from, and that's instudio101 at gmail.com. So for today's topic, mm -hmm. let's talk about fruit tree traps. What do you think, Christy? Sounds great. Okay. Love it. So tell me something. With regards to fruit tree traps, to what extent can they help minimize uh, pest populations, and to what extent do we just use them for monitoring? So it really depends on the size of the orchard that we're talking about. Um, for those backyard growers or small orchards, then using these traps as mass trapping is the way to go. Uh, once you get up into the commercial orchards, then it does require, we're talking thousands of traps, which from a feasibility standpoint is just, it's it's not economical. Um, but yeah, but for the small grower, the mass trapping is, it's quite, quite productive. So it's great. So this is a really productive way to do things. Mm -hmm. So I've got to tell you, Christy, um, not too long ago, a few years ago, I went to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And that was my first encounter of a trap in an or well, in a little home orchard. This orchard was very messy. There was like there was lots of trees in a small place and there were there was lots of disease. Okay. I think she had pest problems too. Now, Mike, I'm gonna get you to put up a picture of a trap <laughs> <laughs> that I found in that orchard. Now it put me off traps almost forever. <laughs> It was seething with bugs dying. Oh my gosh, it was so sad it's to kind watch. Of a horror movie. It was like a horror <laughs> movie. So you had this sort of like bucket and it was filled with dying insects mm -hmm. and their larvae. Mm -hmm. So hopefully Mike is going to put that up for us. Can you tell me what kind of trap is that and is this a good thing? So so it looks like it's, it's some kind of bucket trap. Um and I don't know what exactly they were trapping for, 
But it is a wonderful example of the importance of maintenance. So you've got a trap, your mass trapping, you have to clean it. It's not something that you can just leave. So what it looks like is it got full of flies. I'm assuming it was a fly trap of some kind. So it probably had some kind of bait, maybe a yeast or something that was bringing the flies in. And um, it just hadn't been emptied in a while. So what starts to happen is then suddenly it goes from a place where you're trapping and killing the insects to a place where you're now creating this wonderful breeding grounds. And so you can see the maggots, right? So the, the flies are starting, they're surviving, they're feeding on the decaying other flies, and it becomes a nice little grounds for reproducing. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is incredibly <laughs> counterproductive. Yes. So can they crawl out of these unsuccessful uh, homemade or, or these these fly traps, can they crawl out and they fly can. away? They can. Once you get past, I mean, typically in those traps, they usually have some kind of liquid. And so it's usually a drowning situation that happens, right? They fall in, they drown. Um, but once you start to get those higher levels, you're not cleaning it out, you're getting those higher levels, they can actually just crawl up each other, crawl out and escape. So it's kind of a pointless mm. trap at that point. Okay, so that's how not to do it. Right. So now let's talk about how to do it. Mm -hmm. So we let's, in this first part of the show, talk about some traps that we can use in small orchards to help control populations. Mm -hmm. um, what do we have here that we can start off with? So I just mentioned a bucket trap, right? So this is kind of a commercially available example of one. So let's describe it. Yeah. It so looks like, what does it look like? It looks like a plastic container mm -hmm. with a little green hat on it. Mm -hmm. And there's room at the top for insects to fly in, I guess. Yeah. And so the idea of this, so you can use this for flies, for things like moths. Um, so you would typically have some kind of lure inside, whether it's a pheromone lure, it may be a juice trap, something like that, something to kind of attract the insect to this area. So they fly into these openings at the top and what happens is they get disoriented. And so their automatic ref reflex is to fly upwards. Oh. So they fly into the top knock down into the bottom and that's where you've got that liquid. And so they drowned or you can just leave it empty and they get caught. So sometimes there's funnels inside. So then they can't get back up from the way out. So you, so you either have a liquid in the bottom or dry and that's how you start to collect them as they fall down inside. Now, when you have a liquid in the bottom of a bucket trap like this, like mm -hmm. do, do you fill up the whole thing with liquid? No, sure it would just be, a, no, just be a couple inches at the bottom that you'd have. Um, and that can just be as simple as water. But what I usually suggest is having something in it to break the surface tension on the water because what can happen, the insects are light, so some of them can fall and, and basically walk across water and escape. Oh, wow. So if you put in a couple drops of soap, it helps to break that surface tension. So when they drop in, they break right through the water and that's when the drowning happens. And tell me something. So they drop in mm -hmm. or they go in and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be here. This isn't right. a good place. <laughs> right. They fly straight up. They right. get a concussion or something. They're all dizzy. They're little stars around their little heads. And then they fall into and the water. And they fall in. Yeah. yeah. So it disorients them. Probably they get a little concussion, do you <laughs> think? Probably, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Hopefully they just knock out and it's just a nice, peaceful death. Okay. Nice, peaceful. <laughs> yeah. That, that, it's nice to think of that. Okay. What insects will a bucket trap like this catch for us? So you can do anything from things like flies, moths. Um, if you're going after wasp, that's kind of, there's, there are some, some commercially available wasp tra traps that are similar to this. Um, so those kind of tend to be the typical ones going into these traps. Now, so when let's talk about specific names. What okay. kind of flies would we want to get rid of in our orchards? So you could potentially do something like apple maggot. Um, I wouldn't do apple maggot necessarily in this box. I would probably tend towards the sphere, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but otherwise, things like codling moth, oriental fruit moth, oblique banded leaf roller, any of your leaf roller species. Um, so all of those kind of flying pests are the ones that you want to target for this, the larger bodied flying pests. This is great. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not an expensive thing. How much would something like this cost? Uh, you can buy it in, in a bulk number. So these would run probably a couple bucks per trap. And then depending on if you want to do some pheromones with that, then those are typically kind of 5 to $15 depending on the pest. So it's, it's relatively inexpensive, especially if you've got a smaller block, then you don't need many. Okay. We've got a quick email here from Ty. And thank you for writing, Ty. Hi, Susan. Uh, ties from Oakville, Ontario. Creepy, but very interesting. <laughs> says Ty, love the visuals. Well, thanks for writing, Ty. That's great. Um, okay, let's we'll come back to, mm -hmm. to your uh, the lures. But what else do we have here? That was our bucket trap. So I'm a huge fan of DIYs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so for those that don't like to do the commercial um, bought traps, then you also have the options of making your own. Mm -hmm. 
So I brought a couple of traps that these are ju- these are ones that I have used. This one I just made as an example because I, I have used ones like this in the past. Um, this just came out of the field, though. So I like to raid my neighbor's recycling bins <laughs> on garbage day. Mm-hmm. And I get all of this. Why? I mean, you know, yes, it's wonderful to have these commercial um, traps available, but we've also got so much material that we can use at our own, you know, our own backyard. So this is just simply a lemonade bottle. And what I did was cut out the side window panes here. And so what this trap is, and this is just kind of carabiner from a, a dollar store to hang it, but you can simply just use twist ties or anything like that to put it up in the tree. Um, and so this makes a, a juice trap right here. So you can put a lure inside if you wanted to. Otherwise, you could have any sort of attractant down here, apple cider vinegar, orange juice, anything sweet to kind of attract the insects so they're flying in same thing fly in get disoriented drop down into the bottom and drown in the juice here wow how did you get this hook at the top it's so it's craft time sometimes for me at work yes. <laughs> so this was me just drilling a hole into it yes so poke a hole in the bottom put in a screw and uh, and glue it around but again like i said you can easily put anything like twist ties you can use flagging tape you can use anything that you've got to try and attach it onto the tree with, the, without a problem this is amazing so this is just basically a lemonade bottle mm-hmm. so have a look at that now you made these flaps at the side so that the insects can fly in yes um do, is is there a reason you left the plastic there? Uh, so that when they're they're not just flying up, this is kind of a way to keep them from flying backwards. It's just a way to kind of funnel them in and right. prevent any sort of escapes that might happen. And so they will be attracted either by the cider vinegar. We'll go into what kind what kind of things you could use mm-hmm. for different insects. Or the lure inside. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And then this is something similar. So this is an example of a funnel trap, homemade funnel trap. So this is just a pot bottle cut in half and flipped inside. So the the insect comes in here, drops down into inside here, and you can have some liquid in the bottom if you wanted to. And they can't get back out. The other thing that you can do here, too, you could get an LED light. If you were looking for doing any sort of nocturnal monitoring or anything like that, put a light at the bottom. Same thing. Drops in and can't get back out. Now, this is amazing. So come on, guys. This is a pop bottle. (laughs) I don't drink pop or soda or whatever. You know Um, what? A dollar fifty, though. Dollar fifty. Like, there you go. <laughs> this is two elastic bands. Could I hang it you in could, my tree like that? So sometimes or? I like to use elastic bands just because it's kind of finicky to get things around. So you can wrap it around the, the branch this way. They wear pretty easily, though. So I typically use twist ties. Works the same way. Okay. Twist ties also, you can get a nice good grip so that on windy days it holds it in place. But that's just kind of a quick example of what and you can do. And would my branch be right here? Is that what's where my finger is? You could put it there. You could loop it. You can loop and tie the, the elastic bands or twist ties around small branches that come off. Off, any sort of uh, any sort of fit depends on kind of the structure of the tree. Okay, mm-hmm. let's see. Here we've got an email from Wayne. Hi, hello, ladies. Uh, nice topic. Love the Facebook Live. Thanks for the information. I love that we can make our own traps. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Um, okay, so here we have two homemade traps. Mm-hmm. Now, one is this inside out one. Do Are they attracting different types of pests and what would we get? Yes. Uh, so it, it, they both kind of work in similar fashion and it really depends on what kind of pest you're wanting to attract. So if you just did kind of a generic... Um, say orange juice or apple cider vinegar, you're going to get kind of a mix of everything. Anything that's attracted to that kind of sweetness or um, or that decaying fruit, anything like that. So you'll get flies, you'll get moths, you'll get, you name it. Um, if you start to get a little bit more specific and you really want to use this for monitoring, then you can use things like pheromone lures and putting in specific um, attractants for individual insects. So it depends on kind of what you're looking for. Generalist trap, this will just catch everything, just kind of be prepared to sift through a lot of insects. Um, Otherwise, then you can, like I said, the the lures to kind of attract those specifics. So when do we know that it's time to change this, to to pour out the water? uh, And then do you really advise that we put all the bugs, the smushy, drowned up bugs on a table and inspect them? If if that's what you're wanting, right? I mean, it's it's not necessarily... You, it's the, the thing is, is that using these traps, you're not going to know that they're successful unless you're looking to see what's happening, right? And so I think maintenance of traps on a weekly basis, if not more, is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, so making that effort and going through and looking at it, because otherwise, why did you go through this effort, either buying a commercial trap or making your own, if you're not going to be kind of checking in to see if it's worth your time, right? Yes. Um, so, so having that regular maintenance is important. 
So scheduling that in, like I said, either a weekly basis or if you find like you're catching a lot, then you're going in and changing it more often than that, especially in a trap like this that doesn't have a lot of room. It might be more often. Right. And so, so yeah, so having, having those in and, um, and sifting through, I mean, like I said, if you're, if you're looking for something specific, if you're looking for emergence of a pest, you're looking for activity for a pest, you can get quite a bit of bycatch. And so it's important to look through as, as yucky as it gets, but. Yes. So here's my question. There are so many beneficial insects in mm-hmm. our gardens. How do we know that these homemade traps are not going to catch the wrong thing? And, you know, with bumblebees and... Absolutely. And that's entirely possible because if you are using those kind of general general attractants, things like juice, then that's going to attract our beneficials mm-hmm. as well. So you do have to kind of watch. Um, you can kind of think too, especially in times of bloom time, you will you could kind of pan back a little bit, maybe think about putting that up at once. Most of our pollinators have kind of dropped away from the trees at least. Um, but you are going to get some bycatch, unfortunately, with these kind of things, unless you're using those insect-specific catches. Or, tra- or sorry, lures. And we're talking to talk about lures next Mm -hmm. but first time wise so would you suggest people not put these up at all until after blossom time has finished uh so it depends on the pest that you're going after that's Mm. the only problem some of our guys are going early in the season most of these would be going after things like codling moth or um apple maggot potentially if you're using it um and so those would be later season pests but if you're looking at some of the early flyers spring feeding caterpillars or anything like that that you're catching then those are going before bloom so you kind of have to weigh what it is that you're looking for and when the activity is that's key you're not just putting these traps up at the beginning of the year and leaving them until the end if you're going after a target pest you know the biology of the pest and when it's going to be showing up so you're putting those traps around that time yes exactly so now let's talk about and by the way at the end of the show guys we are going to meet our favorite foes (laughs) our favorite fruit tree pests but in the meantime tell me about lures so you're Mm -hmm. telling me you can make a generalist trap stick in some juice apple cider vinegar maybe a bit of both yep Uh, but if you want to specifically get something, you know you have a specific problem in your orchard, Mm -hmm. what are these lures? Can you show us what they look like? Yeah, well, so this is just an example of one. I'll just put it here on this camera. So so a kind of a general lure, um, in most cases, they're usually these rubber septums, and so they're these small, they almost look like eraser heads, and they're impregnated with a lure. And so in a lot of cases, especially with the moths, then it's using a sex pheromone. And so that's drawing the males to the trap. Um, there are other cases where there's aggregation pheromones. There's, um, with apple maggot, you often use essence of apple as a bait. Um, so there's any, anything that's kind of that scent attraction. Um, and so you use those lures and those are specific to, so the pheromones are specific to that individual species. So there's a codling moth lure and there's an oriental fruit moth lure. Um, and so though putting those in the traps, then, you know, the majority of the insects that you're getting are typically those ones that you're, that you're trying to attract. So I'm picking up this lure right now. Mm -hmm. I'm smelling it. Nothing, sniff, sniff. Nothing, right? No smell. This says nothing to me. I can't smell anything. No. So. So this is only picked up. It's the, that that pheromone is what's picked up on the antenna of of the males right so that's that's insect insect specific if i had antenna would i be able to would you be able to you would be able to pick that up and not necessarily be attracted to it though right, right? so it's just for that species that's attracted to that individual chemical compound right Okay, we've got an email here from Alice. Hi, Alice. Hi, love it. Saving some money with your tips and tricks. Thank you. Alice from Philly. Thank you for writing. (laughs) So talking about money, thank you, Alice, for mentioning it. Um, Are these lures expensive? Are they easy to get? So they're relatively easy to get. So any sort of pest supply place um, that does sell traps typically have um, any sort of lures that are commercially available. Um, And so it depends on the pests. It is the price tag typically they're relatively inexpensive for most of our common pests um that uh, so it's i mean you get them in kind of these packs you can get them in packs and they're they're basically cheap i can't give packs a price of 100 pa- packs usually of 10. packs of 10 25 right. that sort of thing and so um depends on the lure then you can it will last for the season some you have to replace after each generation just to kind of replenish that uh that plume that you're putting out that pheromone plume um so it depends on depends on the pest but they are commercially available with any supplier okay so this is great Mm -hmm. we can be very specific and for folks who are saying well i don't know what insects and pests that i have Mm -hmm. 
a couple of things. We will talk about some of them at the end of the show. Yeah. The other thing is Integrated Pest Management for Fruit Trees is a course that I will be launching very soon. I'm trying to tell myself, get back to work, get it finished. Um, but that will help people to learn about the pests mm -hmm. that they have in their unique environment, mm -hmm. their community, their climate zone, uh, and empower. we will be empowering ourselves into recognizing what the pest problems that we could be having. Absolutely. You know, what are these problems and how do we recognize them? Yeah. So that's good. Okay, so we've got lures, we've got our homemade traps, and they're going to help us reduce populations. Yes. And then there's this. <laughs> and this is a red ball that so many of us have seen. And on Facebook Live, if you're watching, tell me if you've seen these. <laughs> okay, so it's a red ball. It's got a sort of a wire or whatever attached to it. You hang it in your tree. Mm -hmm. And tell me why we use these red balls. So these are for apple maggot. So you can use these as either uh, monitoring, looking for activity in terms of when uh, when the apple maggot is, is active and looking for uh, sites to lay eggs. But you can also use them for mass trapping too. So hanging these throughout the tree um, can kind of outcompete the apples that are growing on your tree as a, as a means of trying to, to manage the, the populations. So with apple maggot, um, what happens is that they, they typically emerge, they're looking for some food. Um, so you can use yellow sticky cards. They're looking for that nectar source. So they're attracted to yellow initially while they're sexually immature. They spend some time feeding and then the females start to look for a place to lay, lay her egg. And what she's looking for is is that nice ripe apple. So hanging these up basically mimics that apple that she's looking for. Now this is, it's a wonderful setup. <laughs> Prepare to get dirty um, because you cover these in tangle foot. And so it's a nice sticky surface. So the female goes to lay her eggs and gets caught. So it's a way of, of uh, trying to maintain that population using these. Now I got to tell you a trick I found on the internet mm -hmm. because I use these. And I was dreading cleaning the yes. dead sticky bugs <laughs> off of there. I, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, you can use saran wrap. Mm -hmm. you, you twist the saran wrap on. Yeah. You paint this tangle foot, which is a really sticky kind of gluey stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on top of it, on top of the saran wrap. And then when it comes time to change it, all I have to do is pull off the That's saran wonderful. Wrap. That's a good tip. Now, you you have told me in the past that you know of an entire orchard that this is the way they protect their fruit trees. That's what they do, yeah. And so now they've just gone to the point where they're just doing the perimeter. They've been able to maintain it so they don't have that resident apple maggot population. It's just that wild population that's surrounding in the woodlot. So what they do is they just basically bait their trees on the outside of the orchard, and it prevents any sort of maggots from coming in. That's incredible. Yeah. Now that's with really intensive monitoring, though, at the same time, right? So they're still maintaining all of their scouting. And if they start to see escapes, then that will change. But at the moment, then that's what they're doing and having a lot of success with it. So if I have a small orchard, let's say I have 10 trees mm -hmm. sprawled around a park, for instance. Right. Um, how many of these would I put one in every tree? I would try and put at least one. I would try and go as many as you can. Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, they're trying to outcompete that beautiful fruit mm -hmm. that you've got on the tree. And so while well, they're might be just the the one there to, to lure them in. Having more would be ideal. So it's as many as you can kind of maintain, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to be a big thing is trying to keep that. It's, it's quite labor intensive um, and economically what you can do with that. So it's, you know, kind of judgment call. How much population do you have that you're dealing with? Uh, and what is your, your time commitment with that? And when would we put them up? This is specifically for apple maggot, I the, understand. Specifically for apple maggot. And so what happens is that they typically start to emerge typically kind of mid-July, mid to late July. Um, the females, though, it takes a few weeks for the females to get sexually reproductive. And so they, um, at that point, it's usually about August to mid-August when they're actually starting to look for an oviposition, a place to, to lay their eggs. Um, so that's kind of that late summertime. So you'd want to start to get those balls out in kind of mid-July time. Mid-July, leave them up till harvest time? Up till harvest. They, yeah, apple maggots will fly until first hard frost. Right. So you want to go as late as you can with that because it's surprising how much damage you get right before harvest. If you get a nice warm fall, then they can just keep going. 
So guys, apple maggot damage, you know when you you cut open an apple and there's just like little brown spots everywhere in there and you're thinking, what the heck is going on here? You may not actually find the little wormy guys in the larvae in there, but you'll know. You'll see it, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of that flecking, that brown fleckling. Is that a word? I'm not sure. (laughs) (laughs) Feckling. I don't know what a word is. (laughs) Brown freckles in your apples (laughs) if you've got freckly apples. So this is awesome. Now we have a question here from Bill. Bill says, those apple traps, where do they sell them? Mm -hmm. What are they called? Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for asking. First, what are they called? So red spheres is typically the the kind of the standard term for them. And I call them red sticky balls. Okay. But that's yep, a same Susan thing. thing, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so those would be at any sort of pest monitoring supply that you can any sort of retailer that you know. Um and I have actually I've seen them at some um some hardware stores as well. So it depends on, you know, what's in your area. Um but online you can get them at uh, at most Pest monitoring supplies. So you'll Google pest monitoring supplies. Mm-hmm. Here in Canada, we mm-hmm. have Salida, Salida, a wonderful, wonderful. company. Yep. Um, in the States, there are some websites where you can get these balls, and yep. they are amazing. Yep, so for sure. send in your questions, everybody. Now, let's do one more thing before we have a commercial break. What was the last, again, we're talking about traps that will reduce populations. Mm-hmm. What else do we have here? So this is just another uh, another example. So this is called a Delta trap. Um, so th- another commercially available available type of trap. So this would be for, again, for your flying insects. So something like your codling moth, oriental fruit moth. Um, And similar to the bucket traps, depending on the size of the orchard, you are going to need a number of these to put out. Um, But the way that these work is they open up here in the bottom. So this is, so anyone that's listening then, this is a a triangle trap. Um, So it's made of kind of tough cardboard. It's nice to have these because these can be reused year after year, as long as it's with the same species, right? So if you're using a lure for codling moth, then this trap stays a trap for codling moth. Once you start putting oriental fruit moth in there, then it's going to cross-contaminate and you're going to confuse your trap catches that you're getting. Um, but then you get these sticky liners. And so same thing, these come kind of pre-coated with Tanglefoot okay. and the sticky liners just slide inside of these traps. And this is what you're removing as you're trapping. So same thing as with the bucket traps, the insect is attracted into that that lure, that attractant that you have in there. Um, and as they fly in, they get confused. They bounce off the sides and then get stuck on the bottom. So the nice thing with this though, is that you can just simply change that trap, mm-hmm. stick in the new liner and you're avoiding that kind of mess that you typically deal with with those spheres. That's incredible. So Mm -hmm. simple. Now notice that this is different and we will in the next part of the show talk about hanging traps, but it's horizontal. Does that make a difference as to who it attracts in there rather than hanging? You know, you could just hang up the card itself. Could you not? To in terms of the sticky trap, yeah, yeah. you could do like, just doing a card. You could have that as well. Um, this works well though in terms of because the sticky card is more kind of a bycatch. So as it's flying by, you luck out with getting it. Oh. Whereas with something like this, it basically funnels the insect in. Um, so then they're more likely to get that catch as opposed to them just kind of passively flying by. Now this is a sticky card, and there's no lure in there. So no. you're again, uh, you're, you're counting on luck that you're. The insect pest is going to go by and say, hey, I feel like going into this little triangle box. So this would be using a lure as well. So you would put the pheromone lure inside to be able to draw that individual in. Now the pheromone lure, here it is. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this tiny thing with little like rubber thing with a wire. Do you hang it inside there? You can. So what actually happens, so it comes just on its own. So this is just my doing of of finding cheap ways of (laughs) being able to put these in. And it's just simply from experience. So what you can easily do is just take this lure and toss it in. So it just sits on that sticky liner. No problem. The thing is, is that I like to keep these for as long as I possibly Mm -hmm. can. And so if you're changing your traps on a regular basis, it's going to get covered in Tanglefoot. Uh So what I do is I simply, when I open it, when I get the lure, um, try and wear gloves if you can, if you're working with multiple species lures. Um, And I just stick a paper clip into it. And so you could also use a pin as well, just a push pin and sticking that through the trap. And I just then stick that into the side of this cardboard. It's pretty easy to poke through. And so then the lure hangs down the center and you you avoid getting any of that tangle foot on. How long do these lures last? So it depends on the species. Um, Something like codling moth or OFM, these lures, it's best to kind of change them after each generation, again, just to kind of replenish that that, uh, plume. But there are some other lures and you can check with the manufacturer. Um, some last for the full season without a problem. So it depends on the species, what you're monitoring for. Okay, this is so empowering. It really, it's amazing because it isn't that hard, is no, it? No, not at all. There's so much fear of round fruit tree traps. So 
Um, here's what I suggest we do. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from a word from our sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. We love you. Um, and then afterwards, let's talk a little bit about some different traps you've brought with you that will help us monitor pest populations mm -hmm. in situations where we may want to take other steps. Um, does that sound good to you? Sounds great. Okay. Well, and also, folks, you remember that today we have a contest, so continue writing us emails and commenting on Facebook. I'll see if there's any comments on there. And you could win our prize today, which is this book. This book here, Mini Meadows. Grow a little patch of colorful flowers anywhere around your yard. And it is a very pretty book. <laughs> so if you want to enter the contest, then send us an email now, in studio 101 at gmail.com. So this is the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast. I'm Susan Poisner, and this is Reality Radio 101. We'll be back right after this little break. In healthy soil, there's so much activity going on. Microorganisms thrive, and good bacteria feed on sugars that seep out of plant and tree roots. In return, these bacteria transform nutrients in the soil into fertility that our plants can enjoy. But what if you don't have perfect soil? Those friendly bacteria may not be active, and your plants and trees may not thrive. There is a solution, though. Earth Alive Soil Activator is an organic biofertilizer that contains three carefully selected bacterial strains that will make nutrients in the soil available to your plants. And your plant or tree will thank you with better growth and a better harvest. Earth Alive Soil Activator has been shown to boost yields in crops including avocados, grapes, strawberries, and even guavas. Go to EarthAliveCT.com to learn more about it and let our friendly bacteria bring your growing spaces back to life. Hi there, I'm Susan Poisner, and I would love to teach you some great skills that will help you take care of your organic fruit trees more successfully. My online courses are for beginner or intermediate level growers. In my certificate in fruit tree care, I'll teach you how to choose your fruit trees, prune them, feed them, and protect them from pests and diseases. In my fruit tree pruning masterclass, I'll teach you all about fruit tree pruning for freestanding trees, decorative espalier plantings, or high density orchard plantings. In my course on integrated pest management for fruit trees, we'll learn how IPM can help you reduce your use of organic sprays. And soon, we will be offering advanced courses too, taught by experts from across North America. Our goal is to take the mystery out of growing fruit trees. Learn more by visiting orchardpeople.com workshops. OrchardPeople.com, we look forward to helping you grow. If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog, we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Wiffle Tree Nursery. Call us today.
Welcome back to the Urban Forestry Radio Show with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, right back to your host of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, Susan Poisner. You're listening. You're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast, brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training Website, OrchardPeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm your host, Susan Poisner, author of the award-winning Fruit Tree Care book, Growing Urban Orchards. So today, we're talking about fruit tree traps. In the first part of the show, we talked about some traps that can help you reduce pest populations in your fruit trees. But there are also lots more traps available that will help you identify what pests are in your orchard so that you can then take other measures to protect your trees. My guest in the studio today is entomologist and integrated pest management specialist Christy Grigg McGuffin from the Ontario Ministry of Food and Rural Affairs. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> now, everybody, this is a really visual show. So if you want to see us as well as hear us, why don't you just go to Orchard People's Facebook page and you can watch us in the studio. If you're listening to the podcast, you'll find a video of this show on Orchard People's YouTube page, YouTube channel, actually. So you will be able to also watch this video. Now, remember, during the live show, if you send us an email with a question or comment, we can enter you into this month's contest to win a copy of this book here. And it's called Mini Meadows, Grow a Little Patch of Colorful Flowers Anywhere in Your Yard. So just remember to include your first name and where you're writing from, and we would love to hear from you. So, Christy, yeah. you brought along some other traps mm -hmm. with you today. So these traps are more for monitoring. What should we start with first? So how about just the general diamond trap? Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so monitoring is key in an orchard because, I mean, that's how else are you going to know what's going on? Um, it helps both in terms of identifying when activity starts because it's not the same time every year, right? It depends on temperature, depends on precipitation. All of those sort of things impact when an insect is going to be active. And so going by last year was June 15th, so this year it's going to be June 5th. 15th is not always the case. Um, so having those traps out then helps you identify when emergence happens, when they're starting to actually peak in their flight, if that's going into a, um, some sort of uh, management system that you're looking for. Um, or if you're starting to get into things like degree day models, maybe we'll get into talking about that later, um, then it also helps for setting things like biofixes or any sort of identification for you to start um, doing any sort of forecast models. So um, so kind of a standard, this kind of goes in line with the delta trap that we were talking about earlier with monitoring for our moth pests. Diamond traps are a great way to do this as well. So they both work in much the same way. It's just that these are um, more of a disposable. And so they break down pretty quickly if we had a really rainy season. Um, but they're really excellent for just being able to identify any sort of traps or any sort of catches. So this is used using uh, a pheromone lure as well. And um, so the way that they kind of come folded up, you and peel they're them. Sticky they're already, sticky already, right? on the inside. Yeah. yeah so they so come, they've got the tangle for yes, whatever. Yeah. And so unlike the Delta trap where the liner you pull out and dispose of the liner, this is the full trap. So uh, so I typically, I mean, depending on how much catch you get, you can scrape the pests off and reuse them. Oh. But as the season goes on, and like I said, as they start to get wet, they get pretty soggy and they start to sag down like this. Once they start to close up, then it's pretty it's ineffective. Yeah. So keeping them nice and open, creating that diamond space is uh, is really nice and that just hangs up in the tree with the lure inside so again you can either toss the lure inside or hang it up in some sort of fashion whatever works for you with that so this is going to help it to tell us how well a what we have mm -hmm. what you know if we have a pest we may be reassured to mm -hmm. find that nothing is attracted to this right. particular lure yep. which means we don't have that pest absolutely um what are the options in terms of how like this will trigger some decision making mm -hmm. and the decision making may be using in our case organic sprays mm -hmm. we only talk about organic yep. stuff so yep. are there other things that we might they might trigger like with this information might it 
trigger other activities that will help us to protect our trees, yeah, or is it mostly sprays? Uh, but not necessarily just sprays, but if you're doing any sort of cultural management, um, and even thinking in terms of what is, um, what's in my area, what do I need to do to try and manage this? Are there um, fruit on the ground that they're going to be overwintering in? Do I need to clean these up? Um, pruning, anything like that to kind of help with, uh, with just the general health and maintenance of the trees, right? So, um, so yes, yeah, so it does help in terms of targeting those key sprays, whether it's organic, conventional, whatever it may be. Um, but then also just having a general understanding of, of what's happening with that pest and uh, and when you need to do any sort of management. Because it's interesting what I got a lot of comment on the internet was saying, well, I don't use traps. It only helps me monitor. Mm. But I guess in the end, monitoring empowers us to know what That's we key. have in our orchard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. once you get the damage, then it's too late, right? And a lot of times the damage can look so similar. What is the pest that you're dealing with exactly, right? Whereas if you had the traps, you know what you're looking for and you know when they're active, right? So then you can really target your your control, um, whatever it may be, at that timing, right? And Perfect. so so understanding what you've got in the orchard is the first step to have any sort of ma successful management. That sounds perfect. Mm -hmm. Now we have an email here. This is Roberta from Rochester, New York. Thanks for the info. Will you have a segment on how to maintain a healthy environment to avoid these pests, if possible? Roberta, thank you so much for writing. I have a course on the topic. It's Perfect. a beautiful topic, but it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. It's called The Certificate in Fruit Tree Care. It's at orchardpeople.com slash workshops. And I'm really glad, Roberta, that you wrote that because we are talking about problems that you may have in your trees. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my approach as an organic grower and a home grower mm -hmm. is I want the healthiest trees I possibly can have. Mm -hmm. I want to boost their own immune systems. Absolutely. I want them to be strong so they can fight stuff off themselves. Mm -hmm. So, Roberta, your question is right on. Mm -hmm. The first thing we're going to do is have healthy trees and know how to take care of them, how to prune them annually, mm -hmm. how to feed them annually and how to prevent any of these problems from mm -hmm. starting in the first place. Mm -hmm. So what a great question. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so there we've got the diamond trap. Um, can you give me, so you can use it with any lure, so mm -hmm. whatever you decide you want to check for, yep. give me some examples. So something like codling moth, oriental fruit moth, oblique banded leaf roller, you name it, tentiform leaf miner, okay. all of those sort of. We can yeah. find out if we have them, if we get the lure. Yes. This is amazing. So now I also understand sticky cards. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. You see them everywhere. They're different colors. Tell me about sticky cards and why are there even different colors and are they all covered with the same sticky stuff? Or? So, yeah, it's <laughs> not even going to attempt to open that. So, yes. So they, uh, the standard kind of generalist sticky card is the yellow sticky trap. Um, so insects have different visual cues. Most cases, when it comes to um, to insects, that's typically based on a food source. So what they're attracted to, and a lot of times it's something like the yellow color. So they have different, on their photoreceptors, they have different color sensitivity levels depending on the insect. So as I said, the generalist one uh, tends to be the yellow sticky card, but you can sometimes see white which is uh, another option, or blue, which is typically for thrips. You'd use a, a blue sticky card. Um, but, uh, but for a lot of things like aphids, um, for any of our leaf hoppers, leaf miners, um, as well as apple maggot, then the yellow sticky cards tend to work the best for that. Um, that one, I'm not sure if you had that smell when I just opened it. No. So this is an apple maggot baited trap. Oh. So it actually has a, uh, an ammonia-based bait that's in the tangle foot. So the tangle foot is kind of the general thing that's put on all of these traps regardless of the color it's got that stickiness um so that's just kind of an added effect to attract the the apple maggot um you can also get just the standard yellow sticky cards and have a, a bait that you put on that in addition to it so there's kind of two options for the apple maggot so i just didn't know if you perfect no i did smell. not i didn't <laughs> smell it so let's now do some close-ups because you know what guys one smush bug to me mm -hmm. looks like another <laughs> so let's have a look at what the different results could be. Mm -hmm. And we've got this other camera here. Yeah. So let's let's see. What, so what, just, we're, what are we looking so at? So here there? we just opened up a diamond trap. Um, so what we have there is um, uh, there's oriental fruit moth in it. Now it's kind of nondescript. It's just this small brown moth. Um, the interesting thing though is, is kind of looking at the size comparison. So that is using an oriental fruit moth lure. So as you can see then, the majority of the insects that you get in that are um, 
are the insects that you're trying to look for. So they're quite small, fairly nondescript. Now, at this point, they've gotten really dark in color, but mm-hmm. that's just because they've started to absorb the tanglefoot. So with time, they get darker. Um, that's why it's really nice to look at these traps as frequently as you can, because then you get that coloration. So something like codling moth, it's got this very nice copper half moon on the back. But once it's been there for a week or two, then it starts to absorb that tanglefoot, and it mm-hmm. just looks then at that point kind of a nondescript moth. So, so having that frequent checking allows you to really see that coloration and distinct banding that might be specific to that species that you're looking for. So can we get, I know with your phone, you've got a fabulous little device so we can get a close up. We'll so see again, if we can with this one. This is oriental fruit moth, right? Mm-hmm. So let's see if we can get a little close up using this device. And by the way, I will find this device uh, online. I'll include a link to it. This is something you attach to your camera. Mm-hmm to just get a little bit closer. So hopefully you guys can see that. I'm just waiting to see if we can see this. We're trying to get a close-up. Okay, so what are we seeing in the close-up? So it's a pretty disintegrated or, uh, oriental fruit moth at this point in time. So this was a catch from last year. So you can see that it's kind of starting to break down with time, right? Um, but like I said, it's just kind of a nondescript, sorry about that, it's just a nondescript um, brown moth is is kind of what oriental fruit moth looks like. Um, whereas once you start to get into some other moths, I'm just going to put some sure. oblique banded leaf roller beside that. Okay. So then you can start to see the difference between these two. And uh, so oblique banded leaf roller is quite a large moth. It's mm-hmm. bell-shaped, so it's really distinct. If you happen, if you luck out and you get a moth that lands perfectly on the trap, which is never the case, but you'll see this really nice bell shape with it. But what's really distinct with oblique banded leaf roller is this light tan color with dark bands across the wings and so it really stands out from some of the other leaf rollers especially you can see the size difference between oriental fruit moth and oblique banded leaf roller so something like codling moth would kind of fall in between these two in terms of size Um, but just kind of having a general understanding of what it is exactly that you're looking for what's the size what's the coloration are there any distinct features that you're looking for with the pests will help you then being able to identify when you're looking at this trap and seeing all these smushed insects what is it that you're looking at right that's the one you want That's so helpful. (laughs) Now, we have an email from Cindy. Susan, love Facebook. Such dynamics, listening and learning in St. Catharines, Ontario. (laughs) Thank you for a very informative show. Thank you so much for writing, Cindy. We love you and appreciate you. <laughs> okay, so we've got a bunch of moths examples here. Mm-hmm. What, let's let's look at another trap for comparison. Okay, so again. let's talk San Jose scale for a second here. Okay, so we've got this is a standard San Jose scale trap. This is a commercially available trap that you can use, and it's very similar to the liners we were looking at before. So it's sticky on both sides. What you can do though is you flip it around. There's little holes in the top here that you punch out, uh, and that's what hangs up on the tree. So you get stickiness on either side. It kind of makes this tent trap. And um, and so this trap is used for the flyers of San Jose scale. So the males have wings. They, they come out from under those hard shells. The males have wings. They fly off to find the females and distribute the, um, the, the colonies around. So we trap those. They typically start flying around pink stage with apples mm-hmm. and they fly over the bloom into petal fall and then you start getting the crawlers. Okay, so guys, pink stage is when your blossoms is, are just, oh, you can see yep. a little bit of pink. Yep. They're opening up. This is on apples. That's yep. called pink stage. Pink, yeah. Okay, so when would we put this up? Before and pink. So, so you wanting, uh, targeting for pink is when you're wanting to put those up because that's when you're going to start to see that activity and then it's really going to ramp up around that bloom time when the males are flying around. So having those traps up then can help you kind of determine when the populations are because once you get that flight, then it's typically about six weeks or so afterwards that you're going to start to see the crawlers and those are the immature stage of scale that then start moving around the tree and head to the fruit and cause all those wonderful little red halos that you get on the, the skin of the fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's nice to kind of target in terms, if you're looking for any sort of controls, um, if you're doing any sort of oils, then you know for the next year when you're putting those oils on uh, to really help to cover those uh, those populations. Okay, so now here in the close-up, what are we looking at? So, so we've got an example of a high, high scale pressure. So this is the wonderful... A uh, wonderful example of San Jose scale flyers. So we're not looking at those wonderful, nice, big black flies. Not what we're looking at are those little tiny speckles. So imagine this is kind of shows just the impact of trapping versus walking through your orchard and looking. Mm. Because how are you going to see these? This is the size of a typical scale on the tree. So 
you observing this. So let's um, just, we're going to we'll look at close up because anybody so looking see. on Facebook Live would see the, I don't know, there's like 12 big these flies. Little, right, these Ignore those big flies because look in. at what we're doing right now. That is amazing. And there all we have this. all of those. So those are the adults for the San Jose scale. So those are the males. Um, really distinct in season. Again, when you first catch them, it's hard on the eyes to see them. But what actually stands out is they're a really nice golden color. And then you get this beautiful dark band right across the stomach that just kind of it pops out. Um, so they can be fairly easy to see if you've got a nice hand lens. But, uh, but again, it's having this trap so that you know when they're flying because otherwise, like I said, walking through the orchard, you're not going to see this happening on the trees. So a really beneficial thing to having those traps is to knowing that, uh, that activity that starts. That's incredible. So you can, so this is magnifying it maybe 10 times. Otherwise, you know, looking on Facebook Live, you see the big flies, you don't see the little teeny mm -hmm. tiny guys. Okay, so that was San Jose scale. Mm -hmm. What else can we compare it to? Is there anything else we should look so at? So this is always a, a cool trap to just kind of talk about. So European apple sawfly, uh, an invasive insect for us now in, in Ontario and heading pretty well across the whole province. It's very significant in the east and up towards Georgian Bay, but coming now to uh, to Toronto and orchards near you um, so so this is uh, this is kind of a cool a cool trap um, very similar to a red sphere in terms of the messiness to try and work with mm -hmm. but the saran wrap is another option for doing on this one too uh, mm -hmm. to kind of avoid the mess so European apple soft lie which tangent do you know what they call it in Europe? The American apple soft fly. God, no <laughs> way. Pass the buck, They're right? They're the Americans <laughs> for that. Oh, my God. So, so they actually, the, uh, the females lay her eggs um, inside the bloom. So torture for trying to, to deal with. How do you manage this? Because the apple is basically destroyed before it's even starting to be developed. Um, so this trap, believe it or not, they fall for it. Um, it just looks like a magnified apple blossom. Huh. So it's covered in tanglefoot on all, on all sides, and it hangs in the trap or in the tree in this 3D form. Um, and so the female believes that, uh, that that's just the, the perfect blossom to land on to lay her eggs who wouldn't with this mega mansion um and so that's where she then gets caught and so it's again it's a way of identifying and seeing you know when when they're ha when they're flying because by the time you get the damage then it's it's way too late to be able and to do anything really christy they fall for this i know believe it or not right they fall for this this is this is supposed to be a blossom well wouldn't you we buy big huge houses right this is the same thing this is they're a looking mega for. mansion <laughs> this is a mega mansion for european apple sawfly which i hate mm -hmm. because it has invaded our orchard in Toronto. Terrible. Yeah, it's yeah, terrible. Yeah. So we have an email here from Cody. Hi, my question. <laughs> You're is, looking me up. Is Christy really a living room dancer? Absolutely. Love it. <laughs> Sounding and looking great in Nashville, Tennessee. So you're a living room dancer? Uh, well, me and my daughters, absolutely. <gasps> every night is the dance party. If you want to join us, 6 oh o'clock in my gosh, living room. 6 o'clock <laughs> dance party, everybody, Christy's house. Thank you, Cody. Okay, so that's, that's look what we've done. We've covered so many traps. I know, traps. I know, amazing. So let us now talk about featured foes. This is our mm -hmm, featured foes mm -hmm. segment of this program, where we will introduce you to perhaps some of the most fierce and fearsome, <laughs> fierce and fearsome <laughs> foes that you will find in your fruity orchard. Sorry, I couldn't find <laughs> enough word enough? for that. <laughs> so let's let's introduce everybody to a few foes. Okay, well, so how about Apple Mega, right? We've been talking about yep. this a fair bit, so let's talk about it. It's always funny how the small guys are, are always the worst. So... Um, it's so, attitude, isn't it? Right? It's the Absolutely. Napoleon syndrome, Absolutely. right? They're little, so they got to make a <laughs> statement. Okay, so we've put again on our other camera, mm -hmm. so you can have a close up at um, some samples of tiny little flies. Mm -hmm. so but so there. But for anyone listening, then there's tons of pictures. All you have to do is Google Apple may get tons and tons of pictures with that um, to oh, be okay. able to see what they look yep. like. And um, so, so it's it, kind of a common misconception a lot of times until people actually see the apple maggot, then it's usually thinking of kind of what you think of as a, a fly, right? A typical house fly. They're a bit ro more robust. They're larger. They're more hairy. Um, apple maggot is actually quite a small fly. And the really distinct banding on the wings is what you're going to use to identify. So a lot of these species of flies, related flies, do have banding of various shapes and forms. The apple maggot, though, has a really distinct 
F band. And again, if you look at pictures online, then you can see that close up and really get a good image of that. Um, so that's what you're going to be looking for on the trap is that distinct F band that's happening. You can get down into, is it male or female? Because that will help. Males typically emerge before females. And so you have a little bit of time then if you're thinking in terms of when you're putting up those red spheres or if you're doing any sort of uh, other sort of control measures. So the females usually have a pointier abdomen. Males are quite round in their abdomen. Females have four white bands, whereas the males have three. So if you really want to get nice close with your magnifying glass, then it's a good way to try and, you know, see what's what point in the, the emergence you're at with that. It's interesting, actually, because from my perspective as a home grower until now, and now I'm joining and learning about the odyssey around, <laughs> you know, the adventure around the actual bugs. But most of us learn to recognize these insects from the effect on the fruit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and or the leaves. And you learn to recognize from that. I mm -hmm. cover that in my course, Integrated Mas yes. Pest Management for Fruit Trees. But what I love about this is we're now le learning about the actual creatures, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and how they look. So let's compare another foe to this one to see how something may look different, a different type of foe. What do we want to look at? Plum curculio? Yes. Let's oh my look God. At this difference. Guys, <laughs> I, I hate to say it. I love you. So Christy, you hold one, I'll okay. hold another because they have to be tilted I'll a bit. For this. Plum curculio is is very damaging and it's also super cute. It I know it's so hard. It's so hard not to love it. It's hard not to love it. Now it, <laughs> it affects apple trees, it affects what else? Plums. Plums, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any sort of basically any sort of fruit. And, any and they'll fruit. go after tree nuts as well in those really soft stages, they'll go after tree nuts too. So why are they cute? Because well, they're so cute. Because <laughs> they look like little elephants. They do. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a bit about them. So they're a weevil. Um, and so they've got these nice long snouts. Um, it's hard to That's see on them. these pin specimens because they are so, they are small. They're small little insects. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, the thing with, uh, with Plum Curculio, what makes them really difficult pests to deal with. So the female, they do two types of damage. They do feeding damage. So they cut with that nice snout and make little tiny holes in the fruit. But the big thing, the one that we typically see is the egg laying scar that they leave. So the female actually with her snout, she'll cut a nice little half moon shape, uh, uh, in the fruit, peel it back and lay her egg underneath the the skin of the fr of the fruit. So so then the larva then feeds and and matures underneath. Um, but uh, so then this leaves this nice little half moon scar that you get as the fruit grows. So they're they're pretty damaging with as cute as they are. Those snouts can really uh, wreak some havoc um, and they move in from those wild hosts. So it's it's hard to kind of get them sometimes in terms of their movement because they're so small. A lot of times you don't know you have them until you start seeing that damage. So can we I wonder if there's a way we can try and get a close up. of them. Uh, I don't know if my magnifying will try and see hmm. with that. Could we take out one of the pins? Um, or is that yeah, not it, they're idea? pretty old though it might oh, fall okay. apart okay i need to get so we're going to try and get a close-up just so, but you guys can also uh, google plum curculio to see some pictures oh, we'll see if we can my fingers are all covered in tanglefoot oh dear <laughs> okay <laughs> well let's see if this works let's give this a try give it a try so i'm looking no, I don't know. no is it not happening so no, we're not never be able mind. To get it. Okay, just look it up on the line, you guys, because these guys are cute. They are They're cute. damaging, but cute. Okay, <laughs> and let's see another one of our foes. How about uh, foes. Japanese beetle, the dreaded Japanese oh, beetle? Yeah. 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 So another invasive pest that we're dealing with. Um, this one's very well distributed across the province and uh, and many other listening areas, I'm sure. So they similar. I mean, it's hard not to love them. They're beautiful, very metallic green, metallic green and brown color. Um, and so the the adult stage is what you're going to see. So they are quite the defoliators. Um, they can skeletonize. So you get the what happens, they feed on the leaves between the veins. So you get this wonderful kind of skeleton leaf that's left on the on the tree, whatever it may be. Grapevines, you name it, they go after. Um, and so the adults are the ones that are there and then they actually pupate and the and and the rest of their life stage is un, in the ground so in the soil at the base of the tree or around the gardens or wherever it is that you're dealing with them 
And um, and so the thing with Japanese beetle, though, is that they actually, once they find a spot that they love, then they start releasing an aggregation pheromone. So it's just calling all their friends to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so where you have one, you will have many, and it continues. So even as you're controlling, whether it's just picking them off and putting them in buckets of water, or any sort of, if you're doing any sort of controls, uh, whether it's organic or conventional, um, all of these work for a short period of time because then they continue to draw back in. So it can be a really difficult pest to try and deal with and uh, and can just come in swarms. So let's now, we're going to wrap up for now, but I want to talk about tools. Now we, you showed us this amazing tool that you put I with the this. camera. Here, I'll take it off so you can see it. And I want to see also hand lenses will empower people. So... Here's tool number one. I'll so, put a link in, in the uh, show notes when I get back. So this is, it's uh, called an app scope, APP scope. And uh, and so it's a really handy tool to have. And all it does is it just fits over the camera um, on your phone. And it works on any phone because you just open up your 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 camera app. Um, and uh, and so then can zoom in with that three to ten times magnif magnification. So it's wonderful for being able to get a good, quick image of something. Um, really handy. I got that off of Amazon, 20 bucks. Anyone wow. can get that. So it's a nice little feature to have. Um, but the other thing, what I always have, and I've got many of these, um, are any sort of jeweler lenses. And those, again, you can just buy them Amazon, anywhere. You can go to your you know, local mm -hmm. supply, whoever might have them. I used to get it all the time at Princess Auto, but then they got rid of them. So now I've mm. had to go to Amazon. Um, but you can get fancier ones like the ones that I just unfolded. And uh, and so it, it really varies. But either, either case, just having that extra magnification to be able to get in close uh, to that... Um, to that pest and see what exactly it is that you're looking at. 